We need you, Lord, in our midst. Oh, Lord, I'm desperate for a touch. I'm desperate for revelation. I'm desperate for inspiration from him. Lord, I pray today that you would encounter every one of us, that you would speak to us, and that we would come to the point of conviction that we, Lord, Father God, would discover your will and do your will. Lord, we are your servants, and we come to glorify you. Let's sing it together.
Jesus, as we go to your word, I pray right now that you would minister and speak to your people. That the word may go forth and not return void. Lord, our hearts are ready to receive. And Lord, our minds are open to hear what you have to say to the bride of church. Speak, Lord, we are listening. Bless this word as it goes forth. You are the ultimate authority. You are our shepherd. We put our trust in you. And all of God's children said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. I don't think you can be sick like me. Now, I just want to say something before I go further into the Word. I want to tell you, the Word of God, when it's preached and ministered, if it's preached under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's prophetic in its nature. Meaning that it is God's inspiration to you. It is God's inspiration to us. As the Heere met ons praat, in die Heilige Gees, is op die woord, hy salt die woord, is die profeet is. En dis hoe kom dis so noodzakelik as a mens kerk te kom, dat jy kom met die oop haar. When we come to church, we must come with open hearts to receive what God has to say. Wie van julle het oop hartig om te kom te ontvang? Who of you got open hearts to receive? Amen. I see Joy is here. Jack, is that Joy, your son? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here, sir. Amen. And welcome once again to everybody that's here. I haven't greeted everybody uh, because I greeted early in the service, but I see some of you have now come in while we've been worshipping. Welcome. It's good to have you here. <coughs> so with that being said, when the word is prophetic in its nature, you've got to understand that there's a threefold reception that takes place. If I say a threefold reception, I mean there are three types of recipients in the church. Dat is drie type mense wat die woord moet ontvang. And it's important that you understand this because sometimes you'll come to church and you might think the word is not for you, but you might not understand that God is prophetically preparing you for something that's going to come. Or sometimes you might think the word is for somebody else, but you've got to do some introspection. And you've got to understand that if God is speaking to you, that means there must be some change that must take place. Or you're all in agreement. So there are three types of people. When the word is preached, number one, the word goes forth to the person that is currently going through this situation or a similar problem. The word becomes inspiration to them and they get the answer that they need. And it's always good to come to church. When you're going through something and the pastor just preaches right into that place that you are in. It's so like as you come to come and the pastor preach in your crawl and trap your twin. Ach, this is lekker, man. As you come to come in your twin and see, Christ the Heere that way. The Heilige Geest was bezig om met you to deal. Amen? The second type of recipient is the person that God is trying to prepare for war. Because God is sovereign. God is omniscient. We are limited. Ek is bepaard. Jy is bepaard. En ons mensdom is ons bepaard. So not anybody in this place, unless you're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but nobody in this place, in their normal human flesh, can come stand here right now and give me a detailed account of what's going to happen tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it's a good thing that you can't. Because you are human. And if you could see everything that was coming, you would be overwhelmed. So you've only got enough grace for today. That's why it's wise to live day by day. And not look too far out ahead. Leave the future in the hands of God. But when you receive word, maybe you're not going through anything. Or maybe in the moment, you can't relate to that word. Understand <coughs> If the word's been preached to you, God is preparing you. The year is biasa om jou voor te bereid. Now I remember in 2020, uh, the church, God laid it on my heart to preach through the life of Elijah and Elijah. If you go read it, the sermons, they're there. Uh, they're on the computer. January, February, March, 
And we went on a 21 day fast. I fasted for the first time 21 days in my whole life. I never had the unction to fast. I could not fast before, but I just all of a sudden received supernatural grace to fast. And I fasted that January 2020. And God just laid it on my heart to start preaching about provision. To start preaching about what you do when you come into a wilderness, when you come into a desert. And then we, at the Bible school, talked about how to prosper financially. And everybody was saying, no, uh, there were a few people, not everyone, a few people were saying, Pastor, can't we preach on the Holy Ghost? And can't we preach on this topic and that topic? And I said, I just don't feel it. I feel God is leading us to this. And there were some of you that sat in that Bible school and we went through that course and we were speaking about how to be blessed and how to sow and how to reap. And we looked at the great lives of the heroes of faith, what they did in a time of crisis. Many don't forget what God Little did we know that what was coming. And when COVID came, all of a sudden, all that which I was teaching just came to life. God was preparing His church in love. Because all of a sudden, there was anxiety. All of a sudden, our world came to a standstill. People were at home weeks, months on end. Some people sat without pay. Contracts were cancelled. And all of a sudden, we had to learn how to trust God. When we received the word, it did not make sense. When we received the word, we were okay. But God was equipping us and He was warning us of what was to come. And if I look back, I can see the hand of God. I can see the art on the ear. And you know, it's the funniest thing. I had a dear brother come to me in the COVID time, going through a financial crisis. And he came to me and he asked me, in fact, he pleaded with me. Please take us through a financial course or something because I I need to learn some biblical principles. And as he said that, I said to him, but we did. We did it in COVID. And then I realized it was never there. Yeah. If you skip class, you're not going to make the exams. Yeah, sure. And the devil to the Watch out. Watch out. If God speaks, listen. Moet nooit dink jy gearefeer. Moet nooit te trots wees om te sê. Dis nie vir my, dis vir die mafaars. Do introspection. Ask the Holy Spirit. How does this word apply to me right now? Okay? So the first type of person is the person that's currently going through the situational problem. The second kind of person is the person that God is preparing or warning for what's to come. And the third type of person and this is a blessed person. God is teaching you so that you can teach somebody else. Amen. Do you know how many times people have come to church and they say, Pastor, the word you preached, I was able to tell my colleague in the week. Because they were exactly going through that. Or Pastor, I need that link. I want to send it to my colleague. Or I want to send it to a family member. And it's the word that they need. And God makes you his evangelist for that moment. Amen. So when you receive... Receive with an open mind so that you don't just receive for yourself, but that you can also teach the word. Amen. Are you all with me? Amen. Let's quickly read the scripture out of the English. Joshua chapter 7 verse 19 to 26, New Living Translation. Listen to what the Bible says. Then Joshua said to Achan, everybody say Achan. Achan. My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. I can reply. It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw. Sorry, I'm being thrown off. I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon. 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They, were hidden in the, they are hidden in the ground beneath my tent. With the silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some men to make the search. They ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there. Just as Achan had said. With the silver buried beneath the rest. They took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites. Then they laid them on the ground in the presence of the Lord. Then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters... Cattle, donkey, sheep, goats, tent, and everything he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor, 
Everybody say Achor. Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burnt their bodies. I like to say Achan became bacon. <laughs> they piled the great heap of stones over Achan, which remains till this day. That is why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. So the Lord was no longer angry. In today's culture and philosophical deed, we put a lot of emphasis on big, on quantity. Ons leven klinkt lo, or cruel. If it's big, it's good. We always want bigger and we always want better. We never content with a little. We are ne never content with the least. We always want more. We always want to strive for more. And I believe it's human nature. From the beginning, God created us to be fruitful and multiply. And as a result of having that nature to have better and have more, sometimes we can move outside of the will of God and strive for ambition that is not God on day. Ons het die ambitie aan die binnenkant van ons wat ons soek meer en meer en meer. En dan kan ons gierig word in die proces. Never being satisfied. Never being content. I mean, just look at it. You can get a brand new phone. It can be the brand new phone on the market. And I've seen this happen and I'm guilty of it. You can get a brand new phone. And my mom's also guilty of it. So she's in the church this morning. You can get a brand new phone. I'll just throw her under the bus while I'm busy preaching. She's my mom. I love her. Anyway. You can get the brand new phone. The latest Samsung or the latest Apple phone. And you can enjoy it. And it can be nice. But let just there come an update on that phone. Or a better a better model of that phone, then all of a sudden your phone doesn't look so nice anymore. Or it is not as nice anymore. Isn't that true? Or just give it some two years and then it's an old phone. Isn't it true? Yeah. Why? Because we want bigger and we want better. It works like that with cars. It works like that with property. It works like that in so many spheres of life. And culture is pushing us in that direction that we must always strive for more, 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 more. We can never be content with what we've got. Mm -hmm. We need to have better. We need to have bigger. There's emphasis on massive, gigantic, enormous. That's the <laughs> emphasis. And as we are pushed in that direction, sometimes when we come to the kingdom of God, we come with that thinking into the kingdom of God, not realizing that God is not always into the big, but He's into the small. Amen. You see, oftentimes in God's kingdom, it's the small things that have the greatest impact. And God's koning krijg, dis soms die kleinste dingetjes, wat die grootste impact het, en die koning krijg van God. I mean, think about this. The great God of the heavens, the sovereign God that sits up in heaven, the Alpha and the Omega, the one that was and the one that is. There was nobody before Him and there will be nobody after Him. Created everything that we see. He created the galaxies. He created the universe. He created the earth. He created you and me. And then He went all into detail, creating microcosms and bacteria. And organisms that we can't even see with the naked eye. So small. You've got to put it under a scientific magnifying glass to even see that it's there, that it exists. We need technology just to look into the details of creation and to see that which is alive. And God who's in heaven took all that time to create everything in creation and he went so deep into detail. You see, sometimes we must realize that God is into the little things. Amen. God is in the details. In fact, listen to what Jesus said. He spoke in his word and he said these words in Matthew chapter 17 verse 20. He said, I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. 
and nothing will be impossible for you. If you just have small faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move something as big as a mountain. What God is actually saying to us through the scriptures is the minute can move the massive in the scriptures. The most powerful force on earth, faith, can move physical mountains, can move emotional mountains, financial mountains. It can move the mountain of sickness and disease. Little faith can do great things. That's what Jesus said, because small things matter to God. God is into the small details of life. It also works in the reverse. As much as it works in the positive, it also works in the reverse. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15, Solomon writes these words. He says, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And the Afrikaans, they say, it's the clay yakutsis, but even at the death. It's the little things, the little things. We see it in marriage. It's not often the big things somebody does or somebody says. It's the little things that grates a person. It's the little things that cause an irritation. It's the claim the knees. It's a debar. You have been married more than 10, 15, 20 years. You'll be able to say, Pastor, that is true. It's the claim the knees. It's the small things. And oftentimes it's also the small things that mean the most, that matter the most. Just that little thought. Just that little gift. Just going out of your way a little bit, that can mean so much. It's the little things. Kijk wat die persoon langs jou sê, dis die klein dingetjies, wat saak maak. Look to the person next to you and say, it's the small things that matter. In fact, God measures faithfulness by how you handle the small. Matthew chapter 25 verse 23. If you are faithful with little, you'll be trusted with. So God watches how you handle the little. How you handle the little. In fact, if you ever want to see who somebody really is, don't listen to how they speak to you. Don't take, don't take heed to their compliments. Don't look at what they say to you that might impress you. Watch how they treat the little people. Watch how they treat the waiter. Watch how they treat the petrol yonkey. Watch how they treat the homeless person. Because the people that they don't need, the way they treat them, says more about them and the way they treat people that they need. Who yet he claim means he's up here. Say, by if I'm yo, I suppose. It says a lot about your character. Amen. Are you all with me? Amen. If you don't think small things matter, you've never slept in a room with a mosquito. <laughs> if you think small things don't matter, as a parent, you didn't walk in the middle of the night and step on a little Lego block. If you think small things don't matter, you've never walked with a little stone stuck in your shoe. Small things have got big impact. And in this chapter, chapter 7, it's about how something small and seemingly insignificant had a big impact on the nation of Israel. One person, one small thing, one small action had big consequences. Now, if we read the book of Joshua, we see how the nation of Israel has come into the land of Canaan. They have come into the land of Canaan with such force and with such a testimony. The book starts off where God is speaking to Joshua and he says to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, I'm with you, Joshua. As I was with Moses, so I am with you. You do not have to fear. You do not have to worry. Be strong and courageous. He repeats that promise three times in Joshua chapter 1. He encourages Joshua. Joshua is excited along with the people. They receive a testimony from across the Jordan. From the prostitute Rahab. That the people were scared of them. That their hearts melted in fear. When they realized that the Israelites were at the border of the promised land. And the getuinis ontvang that die mense, die burgers van Canaan, was bang vir hulle. Dat hulle harte versmelt het. Terwijl hulle die belofte laat was en hulle het gehoor Israel is op die grens. Want hulle het gebeurd en hulle het gehoor dat God het vir hulle geveil. They heard about what God did to the Egyptians. They heard about what God did to the kings on the other side of the Jordan River. They heard of what God did to the Amalekites. And they were fearful and they were scared when the Israelites stood at the border of the promised land. 
and to strike more fear into them. God splits the Jordan River wide open that the whole nation of Israel can come into the promised land. At a time where the Jordan River in Joshua chapter 3 would have been flooded. At the harvest rains, it was flooded. The priests with the Ark of the Covenant, the Lefitis Priestess, Midi for Bonsar, Chan Adi Yodatsa Refit, and as they went into the Jordan River, the, the river, the Jordan River just split wide open, just like that. And when it went over, open, more than two million people crossed over on dry land. Talk about making an entrance. Did they just even start to wear it? No, Kongamulika. Yesterday, I stood in your thoughts and if we put Mark Fuller, but but can all snow down? How are we going to ever be a force against these Israel, Israelites? How are we going to ever wage war against them? Even the Jordan River is making its way open for them. And as they come into the promised land in Joshua chapter 5, they stop at Gilgal. There's a purification ceremony that takes place. There's circumcision that takes place. That is symbolic of the flesh that has been cutting off. And right after that, Joshua has an encounter with God. Joshua come and unrock and many and God speaks to him and ministers to him as he's about to go to Jericho to possess the city of Jericho. Now Jericho was fortified. Jericho was considered unconquerable. Nobody could conquer Jericho because it wore, its walls were too high. And it seemed like a fortress. In fact, if you read Joshua chapter 6, you'll read of how Jericho was shut up that nobody could go in. Nobody could go in. And while the enemy thought that they had a plan that Israel could not overcome, God has always got a strategy, got a plan that the enemy doesn't see or know about. And for the three months said, but they give the devil the guy the better from you to cry, but the Yerah is always the best when they score. You know, God is God that He can make a way when there seems to be no way. You might not see a way, you might not see a door, but God will make a door because He's God. God can make a way. He is God. He is sovereign. Stop the pursuit of the and say, when you worry, the year is all about mark for you. God will make a way for you. And then if I'm not going to get you excited, your neighbor must get you excited. But you've got to get out of church and you've got to be excited today. Amen? Did everybody say amen? Amen. So the Bible says that they came to the city of Jericho. And with a battle strategy from the Lord, Joshua is obedient unto God. And as this battle strategy is executed, the walls of Jericho come crashing down. And the Israelites go in and possess the city of Jericho. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. God is on their side. God is fighting for them. Man, they're defeating the Canaanites. And now all of a sudden, the Bible says in Joshua chapter 6 verse 27, that God was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout of all of Canaan. Everybody was talking on social media about Joshua. There were videos going around. People were saying, watch out, here comes the Israelites. Their God wages war for them. Their God is more powerful than our God. Our idols will melt in the midst of their God. Their God, if he fights for them, there's big trouble. And all of a sudden, the Canaanites were fearful and anxious, and uh, all of us brought them a comet and unstuck. And it's a great testimony. Man, it's good to be a child of God when everything goes well. Amen. This is lekker dan om my kind van die Heere te wees as die bank reken en prop vol is. Dis lekker om my kind van die Heere te wees as jou man skoolig goed was. Dis lekker om my kind van die Heere te wees as jou baas jou verwoord en gee. En dis lekker om my kind van die Heere te wees as jou vrou vir jou koffie maak in die ochend as jy moet opstaan. It's a nice thing to be a child of God when everybody's nice to you and there's money and all your accounts are paid and you are healthy, fit and strong. Hey man, dis lekker dan om my kind van die Heere te wees as alles net goed loop. But, everybody say but. Yes. There came a but. <laughs> As I said but, you should have seen some people here. Yes, yes. I get pastor. There came a but. Listen to what Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 says. But. Starts with those words. But. Everybody say uh oh. Oh. Yes, trouble. But. Ma. What's up with Ma? Die lewe is goed, maar. Alles het goed doel ook geloop tot maar. But. 
The Israelites acted unfaithfully. Now remember, the Bible was written as one storybook. Every book of the Bible was written as a storybook. So if you had to read the book of Joshua, you would have read from Joshua chapter 6 right into Joshua chapter 7 with no break. It was us as humans that put in chapters and verses. God didn't put it there. So you can imagine you're reading Joshua and you're reading about how famous he is and how his fame is spread through the land and all of a sudden you're reading about how Israel is unfaithful in the sight of God. And I wouldn't blame you if you thought this is a different story. What's happening here? You get that you read your story and you find it from the one verse to the other verse to this amper. You think it's now that the self the story is to a winner and even still it is all good. Yeah, it's victory, and now all of a sudden, yeah, it's defeat and failure. What's happening? Life is like that. One day you're up on the mountain, you're worshiping God, you're going to church, you're having revival, and the next day you're in the midst of the battle, and you're being attacked, and you're fighting the spirit of depression, and you're fighting demons. And you feel like you can't go further. And you feel like you cannot stand up. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? Yes. But Israel were unfaithful. Israel were unfaithful. Israel were unfaithful. Israel was not getrouw. There was iets wat hulle gedoen het. Wat die Heere bedoef het. They did something that grieved God. Let's read. Let's read what the Bible says. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1. If you can just put it on the board. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. And the Afrikaans. The Bible says this. But the kids of Israel had to be grip on the bondgoed. The B-gedeelte. And they had the bondgoed genomen so that the throne of the Heer on flame had the kids of Israel. In other words, the oordeel of God had given them. Yeah. <coughs> The children of Israel acted unfaithfully. They took from the things that were devoted unto God. Joshua chapter 7 verse 1 in the English. Please be winning. They took from the devoted things that belonged to God. So the Lord's anger burnt against Israel. It burnt against Israel. Notice that which is devoted unto God when it was touched. God was angered. When that which was holy was taken into man's possession, God became angry. Verse 2, listen to what the Bible says further. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which was near beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. Verse 3, when they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Said so two or three thousand men. To take it and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. So about 3,000 men went up. Let me quickly translate that in the way that I understand it. Go back to the Here's Yosha. He had not yet a great overwinning gehad the Jericho. And now he knows that he will be driving to the next stad, Ea. And he knows that he will be able to go to the Ea. Maar hier het hulle so groot oorwinning gehad oor die stad van Jericho. Hy besluit, jy kom ek stuur vir Juna om dit uit te check, om te sien hoe lyk na die plek. Hulle kom terug, hulle sê, ach nee man, daar is een klein dorp, nie, daar is nie eens baie mense daar nie. Moe nie ons moet die belas om die hele weermacht te stuur nie, stuur net so paar duisend, so twee of drie duisend, dit sal so goed is. Just send two to three thousand to this little town it's insignificant. There's not much people we will be able to handle. Remember, Joshua does not know something has gone wrong spiritually. He's still drunk on victory. He's not only nuchter van die oorwinning wat hy nou net gehad het. Allemaal is opgewonnen, allemaal praat over. And now their confidence overtakes them. You see, it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. To become too confident. Amen. To start becoming arrogant. That's for sure. You know what prevents me from being arrogant? I stay on my knees. 
And the Bible says they went and they waged war against AI. Hulle gaan in hulle voer oorlog uit tegen AI. En daar kry hulle een mooi Afrikaans sterre met een groot pakslag. There they got a hiding to nothing. Twelve love, they were knocked out. There they went and they were supposed to just knock out AI, possess the city, but in fact now they on the run, the Bible says. And while they were going down slopes, 36 men were killed by AI. 36 men! Does it sound like a lot until you consider that in that day, 36 women in Israel became widows. 36 families had to be- bury a household leader. Children became orphans in Israel that day. 36 families in Israel were affected by this battle. And Israel suffers their first defeat in the land of Canaan. And it's shocking. And it overwhelms them. In fact, the Bible says there in verse 5, the big part, and at this the hearts of the people melted and became like water. My heart would have also melted. Just if AI gives us such a idea, what about the rest of the cities? What about the rest of the tribes? You have big trouble. Amen. Something has gone wrong. It's a though grass is for Kirkwood. And their hearts melted as a result. I wonder if your heart has ever melted on the inside of you. I'm not talking about physically melting, but that melt, you just, your, your, your heart sink me. You just feel your heart sink. When you receive bad news, when you hear a bad report, when you see something take place, or you hear of something take place, and it just hits you in the stomach, and it knocks your wind out. That's where Israel are. Their wind has been knocked out. But you see, Joshua made a mistake. And it's a mistake we all make, and it's a mistake that I make from time to time, and I've got to be careful not to repeat this mistake. Joshua sent men to spy out Ai without praying. If you read the book of Joshua, and you read and study the leadership that Joshua had, you will know one thing is for certain. He was a man of prayer. Joshua was a man of gebed. Hy het geweet om om te bid. Hy het geweet om om inspraak te kry van die Heere. Hy het geweet om gehoorzaam te wees van die Heere systeem was kritisch. To Joshua right throughout his rule and reign as he took the children of Israel into the promised land. He's constantly making prayer a priority except in Joshua chapter 7. Hy maak dit nie a prioriteit nie. Wat maak hy prioriteit? Dit wat die kinder gesê, 